Welcome to Glory Stories with Dr. Elizabeth Vaughn. Dr. Vaughn was one of the top eye surgeons in America and has traveled to many countries in the world preaching the Word of God. She also opened up an eye surgery center in Beijing, China, where she did free eye surgery on those in need. Dr. Vaughn will be sharing many of her personal experiences from God. In addition, you will hear of others that have known God in an intimate way and seen His miracle working power. As you hear about how God has worked in the lives of others, our hope is that you will be changed forever. Get ready for God to heal you, deliver you, and transform your life as you sit back and enjoy these glory stories. Welcome to Glory Stories today. I'm going to be sharing with you today about Ruth Ward Heflin, which happens to be a, a, a dear close friend of mine. So it really gives me joy and pleasure to talk about li her life. She was a very unique human being in many ways. I'll tell you about it. She was born in 1940 into a Pentecostal family. Her father and mother had formed a Pentecostal camp in Virginia, and they also pastored a church in Richmond, Virginia. And so in her whole life, she grew up in Pentecost. She was, she was in many meetings as a small child where the presence of God was very strong, where she could feel the presence of the Holy Spirit and, and became familiar with things of God and things of the Spirit at a very, very early age. That's all she knew. She grew up in church. Uh, even sometimes they'd have meetings morning, noon, and night uh, for months and months at a time. And so that was really her life. So she had an advantage over many of us because she knew God and she knew the Holy Spirit pretty much all of her life, whereas most of us did not. Anyway, when she was 15 years old, she had a vision. In this vision, she was, she was eating out of a bowl with chopsticks, and there were Chinese people around her. They were all eating together out of bowls with chopsticks. And she absolutely fell in love with the Chinese people. She never knew a Chinese person. There wasn't any of them around. But because of this vision that God gave her, she was absolutely in, in love with the Chinese people. Her father joked with her and said, you know, when she finally did leave home, he said, now we can go. We don't have to always go to Chinese restaurants for your birthday and special occasions because that's what she always wanted to do, go to Chinese restaurants because that's the only place that she could be around Chinese people. So when she was 16, oh, well, wait, I'll tell you about this, 15. So she had the vision in a church meeting at age 15. And at that time, she really felt Chinese. And she felt like she looked Chinese. She did, it was like a transformation because of the vision. But when she walked out of that meeting that night, one of the boys, he said, you look different, Ruth. And she thought, oh, you're, you're just, you're playing with me. What do you mean I look different? He said, you look Chinese. And I, I can tell you her heart was Chinese for sure. So she began wanting very much to be able to go live and be with the Chinese. But she was young. She was 16. She was a very bright person, and she had skipped several, several uh, grades in school. So she had finished her uh, high school academics at that age, and she was considering going to, to a college or a Bible school. And a, a president of a Bible school prophesied over Ruth at that point, and he said, from God, he said, desire not earthly wisdom and knowledge, but seek me with all of your heart, and I will give you my wisdom and my knowledge. So when she got that word from God, she abandoned the idea of going to, to a higher level of education, and she knew then that she was called to go straight into ministry. In fact, at 16 years of age, she was invited to come hold a two-week revival up in the mountains of Virginia. So she started ministry right away. Then she met a lady that had been a Chinese missionary during World War II, and the lady had been home uh, because of the war situation. She was sent back home, but she was wanting to go back to China at that time. And so Ruth said, if I can, if I can figure out a way to be able to come to Hong Kong, can I stay with you? Can I live with you? And the lady said, yes, sir, I'd be happy to have you. So Ruth started trying to earn money and save money and, and try to get up enough money for, for fare to go to China, to Hong Kong. She, after a while, she had put together quite a bit of money, but she lacked $500, and she met a couple. She met a couple that was going to go to China. So she asked the couple, can I go with you to China? 
And they said, yes, yeah, sure, you can come with us. But she lacked $500 for her fare on boat fare, uh, the, the boat fare to get to China. So uh, her brother, Wallace Heflin, who really wasn't serving God at that time, but he loved his sister, he went down to the bank and he borrowed $500 from the bank to give it to Ruth so she would have passage to go to China. So she booked her, China, her, she booked her passage to go to Hong Kong with this other couple. Well, at the last minute, the other couple... I don't know what happened to them, but they, they backed it. They couldn't, they couldn't go to the, on the trip that they had planned. And so now Ruth had booked her passage, and she was by herself at 18 years of age. And her parents sought the Lord, you can imagine. They sought the Lord vigorously, whether they should even let her go or not, alone, 18-year-old girl on a boat to China. And the Lord said yes to let her go. So at 18 years of age, she started her life as a missionary, and that's what she did the remainder of her life. So she went to Hong Kong. She lived with the, the woman that had been there in World War II. She learned fluent Cantonese. She could speak Cantonese, Mandarin. Later on in her life, she, she could speak uh, quite a bit of Arabic, quite a bit of Hebrew. She's a very bright woman. And God did just what he said. He gave her his wisdom and he gave her his knowledge, which is far superior to any wisdom or knowledge that the earthly institutions can give us. So she spent quite a few years there in Hong Kong and, and loved the Chinese people, ministered to them, and eventually she moved her ministry to Jerusalem and called it Mount Zion Fellowship. Well, that's where I met Ruth. I'm going to tell you how I met her. Uh, the other lady that traveled with me a lot, her name was Jerry. Jerry and I were in Jerusalem. We had been there before, and so we decided we were going to Adventure, adventure out a little bit and go to some area we'd never been before. So we were in the old city of Jerusalem. We started walking into some area. We didn't know what area it was. And we kept walking and, you know, and we, it got into an area that was kind of like a maze. It was just walls here, walls there, walls there. There were gates on some, in some of the walls, but there were just walls. And pretty soon it started getting darker and darker. And Evening was, was upon us, and we were trying to figure out how to get out of this maze of walls. And we just we couldn't figure out how to get out. We got in, but we couldn't figure out how to get out, and there was nobody around. People weren't around. You could go to the other sections of the old city. There would be people there, merchants there, people walking. But in this section, there were no people. But finally, we saw one man, and we were getting, you know, we were praying, God, please show us how to get out of here. There's one man that came walking down the walkway. I'll never forget him. He had a newspaper under his arm. And uh, Jerry, being a very gregarious person that she was, began a conversation with the man and asked where we were. He said we were in the Armenian section of the old city of Jerusalem. And so, you know, she likes to start a conversation with total strangers. So she tries to think of something that we might have in common with him. Okay, so he, we know he's an Armenian. The only other Armenian that we knew was Dima Shikarian, who was the head of Full Gospel Businessmen. So Jerry says to this man, oh, do you know Dima Shikarian? Well, yes, he, he did know Dima Shikarian. So uh, that was, that was a, a point of conversation. So we talked some more. The man invited us to come to his home in that old city of Jerusalem, which was very meager. It used to be a stable, and he, he, had, he had an upright piano there with a cover over the piano. It was the most prized possession that he had in his home. Well, Jerry's a professional musician. He didn't play. His wife didn't play. Nobody he knew played, but he just kept that as a prized possession with a cover over it. So when Jerry came, he took the cover off of that piano, and Jerry sat there in this man's house and just played glorious music and made him so happy, made his wife so happy. They were just thrilled that somebody could play the piano. And, of course, she played very, very well. And I remember his wife made us some cracked, uh, cracked wheat with a little bit of sugar and a little cinnamon on it, and that's what they served us that evening. And so it was, it was a wonderful evening for us because we got to see what a home was like in the old city of Jerusalem in the Armenian section. So this man says to us, he said, you need to come Friday evening to uh, St. Peter and Galicantu Church. He said, there's a woman from America that is in charge of that meeting. And he said, I think that you would enjoy it. Well, we were there. We didn't have anything in particular scheduled for Friday night. And so we said, OK, we, we'll, we'll try to be there. Well, I'll tell you what, this night, 
was a, a night that would change our lives. We walked into there. He said it started at 7. We walked into there at 7 o'clock that evening. And there were, there were pews there, but nobody was sitting in the pews. Everybody in the building was down at the front, in front of the pews, and they were singing and dancing unto the Lord. They were singing, when I say dancing, they were dancing like Israeli dances, like line dances, back and forth, singing, or circular dances, singing. And, and, and what, was, what they were singing was what Ruth called the new song, which means that one person in the group, would, God would give them a, a, a little chorus of some sort, spontaneous I'm talking about, new, it was new. A spontaneous chorus, they'd start singing this chorus. Everybody would be able to join in. It would be a very simple chorus, and it would be easy to join in. Someone might come up with a second verse to it, and then we'd start singing that. And you just sing the same thing over and over. It's, it's kind of like you can get lost in the spirit because you don't have to think about the words. What are the next words, you know, in songs? Sometimes you have to think about what are the next words. But with the new song, you didn't have to think about that because you were repeating the same thing over and over till someone would come with a new, another new song and begin that. Easy. These are easy things, easy things to catch on to. Everybody would start singing it, start singing it. Well, this singing and this dancing like this went on and on for about an hour. There was no, there was no musical instrument. There was no person that was apparently in charge of this. It was just everybody was down there together. Nobody was up on a pulpit preaching or any. There were no musical instruments. It was just all spontaneous. It was glorious. So much revelation came to me personally, and I'm sure to everybody there. Revelation from God about things, uh, the knowing about God, just being in his presence. You can't be in the presence of God without being changed, and we were changed. Well, about when an hour was about up, this tall lady came to me, and she said, don't I know you from somewhere? I said, I, you know, take one look at Ruth and you'd know if you met her, Ruth, or not. I said, no, no, <laughs> no, I've never met you before. And she said, well, I, I she kept looking at me. She says, I, I'm sure that I've met you somewhere before. I assured her I hadn't met her. But anyway, she was convinced that she had met me. So she says, just wait a minute. Just stand there a minute and, and I'll, you know, the Lord will show me where. I stood there. In a minute or so, she said, I know I know why I recognize you. She said, I was in the United States visiting my family, and I saw the Phil Donahue show, and you were on the Phil Donahue show giving uh, testimony about a man named Ronald Cohen who could see without an eye. I said, oh, my goodness. She had remembered from a year before on one television program seeing me, and now she recognized me this day in Jerusalem. That's the kind of woman Ruth was. I, I can't imagine how she could. She had a phenomenal memory. She could remember places and names of people and, and name leaders of countries and little people that were insignificant. She would remember everybody's name from everybody, all the countries that she'd been to. And she'd been to every, when it was all over, said and done, Ruth had been to every nation on the face of the earth that would allow her in. There was a, a, a very few, but a few that wouldn't allow anybody in, and so she couldn't get in. But other than that, she was in every nation of the world because God sent her to the nations. She was called to the nations. And eventually, I, you know, she transferred that calling to me, and I'm called to the nations. And that's why I traveled the nations. Anyway, back to the story. So when she realized who I was, she said, well, would you minister tomorrow morning at Mount, on Mount Zion? in our fellowship, Mount Zion Fellowship. And I said, sure, I'll be glad to. Well, so the, that morning came. I was in the middle. i tell you what. At that point in my life, I was in the middle of building a 5 million watt Christian television station in the Dallas-Fort Worth Metroplex. And it was a horrendous undertaking. It required all the faith that God had put in me to believe him for all the needs that we had. And so I, I began ministering that morning on Mount Zion Fellowship about walking on the water because I had been walking on the water for quite a long time. Walking on the water means walking by faith. That's what that means, walking by faith. In fact, I'd been walking on water so long. I remember talking to the Lord once and saying, Lord, I've been walking on this water so long. Can't you just put me on the shore for a little while and let me rest? And he said to me, he said, well, I'm out here on the water. Now, where would you like to be? I said, oh, you know, you're out on the water. I, I'll stay out here on the water with you. So 
I stayed out on the water. So I got up that morning and I started talking about walking on the water, walking by faith. Well, I didn't know Ruth. I mean, I didn't know Ruth. I had just met her for the first time a few minutes the night before. I knew nothing about her life, nothing about her. And what I didn't know is that Ruth had a group of people that had been waiting for months and months and months trying to get a visa to go into China. She had some people meeting waiting to get visas on the West Coast and another group of people waiting abroad in a foreign country. They were all waiting to get visas to go into China. They wanted to be the first group to go in that are Christians that could live there in the nation of China. And they couldn't get a visa and they couldn't get a visa and they couldn't get a visa. And, and the, you know, they were out of funds and Ruth couldn't leave them there any longer and she didn't know what to do. So she had been praying that day and she said, Lord, you, I ask you tomorrow when that doctor speaks at Mount Zion Fellowship, I ask you to give me a word through her to tell me what you want me to do about this situation. Well, I didn't know that. Thank, I'm glad I didn't know that because I just spoke about what God put in my heart to speak about. So when Ruth heard me say, you need to walk on the water, she knew immediately what God meant that she needed to walk by faith uh, about getting all of those people into China. So knowing Ruth what I, that I know her now, I understand she left the meeting in the middle of the meeting and she went straight to the travel agent, which closed at noon on Saturday, which was Sabbath. And she, got, she wanted to get there before they closed and she booked herself the next flight, immediate flight that she could go to, to California. That's the way she did. She just did things. She turned on a dime. Boy, she got going. And so, you know, I went on back to America. The Lord told her, he said, on Thanksgiving Day, you're going to have something to be thankful for. Well, this was just, you know, a couple of days before Thanksgiving. So she got to California in time. She flew to Hong Kong. That group flew to Hong Kong. And by the time they got to Hong Kong, that day they had gotten visas to go into China and it was Thanksgiving Day in Hong Kong, and they had a great Thanksgiving feast and, and, and thanksgiving unto God for allowing them to get visas to go into China. So that's how I first met Ruth Heflin. Well, we became fast friends after that. She came to my home on many, many occasions. I can remember one night she was sitting, she, she and I were sitting out in the, in, the, in the back of my house in a jacuzzi, and, and it was a summertime, and there, you know, it was, it was a beautiful night. And the only thing Ruth talked about that night was glory. Well, back in those days, nobody talked about glory. Nobody even knew what glory was. But Ruth was way advanced. She was far ahead of, of her day, really. And so she was speaking about glory. And the next day, <laughs> I remember one of my employees knew that I was going to be with Ruth the night before. And, and she said, what did Ruth say? What did Ruth talk about? What did she tell you last night? I said, well, she talked all about glory. And my employee said, what's that? You know, what's that? <laughs> well, Ruth ended up writing a, a number of books, quite a few books, and all of them have the name glory. The, her first book she wrote was named Glory. And then she wrote lots of unifying glory, river glory, harvest glory, Harvest Glory was a big book that was more like a biography of Ruth's life, which if you're going to buy a book, that's a good book to buy, Harvest Glory by Ruth Ward Heflin. But all of her glory books are wonderful. Uh, another time she was at my home, and she wakes up the next morning, and she says, well, I'm going to the Philippines today. Oh, okay, Ruth. I mean, that's, that's the way she was. In fact, she reminds me of what Jesus said to Nicodemus. Nicodemus was a man who came to Jesus one night, uh, you know, undercover, because he, he was an authority in the Jewish religion. And, and he, so he came uh, undercover to Jesus, and, and Jesus was explaining some things to him, and he said uh, that the wind blows wherever it wants to, you can hear it, but you don't know where it came from. You don't know where it's going. He said, that's what it's like, people that are born of the Spirit. Well, Ruth was filled with the Holy Spirit, and she blew wherever the Holy Spirit, the wind of the Holy Spirit would take her. So that morning, he was going to blow her to the Philippines. It really wasn't any surprise because that's the way she did her whole life. So, okay, Ruth leaves Dallas. She goes to the West Coast. What we didn't know, we didn't know this until later on, that when she left my house, she didn't have any money. She never carried any credit cards. She carried usually one little bitty bag. That was her luggage. And that's what she traveled the world with. And she trusted God. 
just like some of the other people I've told you about. She just simply trusted God. So when he says to go to the Philippines, you get up and you go. She had an airline ticket that would take her from the East Coast and be able to stop and still and take her to the West Coast of the United States. So she had a ticket to get to California, but she didn't have anything beyond that. But she went. Well, when she got to California, a lady met her and brought a friend along, and they had a little lunch together. And when they, they were leaving, one of the ladies gave her a little, a little something in her hand. She put it in her pocket. When the ladies were gone, she pulls it out and, and to see what it is. Well, it's exactly enough money to get her an airline flight from Los Angeles to the Philippines. So she goes to the Philippines. She ends up being uh, invited to stay in the president's palace there where some of, the st some of the family members and staff of the palace get saved, get filled with the Holy Ghost because Ruth was there. By the time she leaves, they say, please, if you come back to her, next time you come back to the Philippi Philippines, please come stay with us again. We want you to stay in the presidential palace with us. That's the way that Ruth traveled. Well, lots of times she would get a word from God or, or have a vision and she would just act on it. I remember one night she had the word Chad. She got the word Chad in the middle of the night from God. She didn't know where Chad was. She figured it was some place. She looked it up the next day, found out it was a country in the middle of Africa. So she books flight to Chad, knowing that God gave her the word Chad, meaning he wanted her to go to Chad. She knew nobody in Chad. She didn't know why she was going, but it didn't matter. She didn't need to know why she was going. She just knew God said, Chad. So she goes to Chad. She, she has another lady with her that travel with her some. And so they get there, and they, they decide, okay, we'll look in the phone book, and we'll call somebody that's a Christian. And so they f try to find a church there, and they call, and they say, you know, we're, we're missionaries here. We're from Jerusalem, and we were here to... I don't know what they said, to visit or whatever. They said, oh, we know, we know an American uh, missionary that's over here. You ought to get in touch with him. And they tell him the man's name. And so they continue to look around a little bit. They find someone else, another church, and he gives them the same name that the other person gave them of the same individual. So they figured that must be why we're here at Chad. So they find where this missionary is, and they go out there. Well... You know, he and his wife, the missionary and his wife, they, they're from a denomination that does not believe in divine healing. But this missionary was having such severe problems. The nails, his fingernails and his toenails had separated from the nail bed, and it was excruciating pain to him. And on his last furlough, they told him that if he couldn't get this healed somehow or another, that they were not going to allow him to come back to the mission field anymore. And that was their life. The mission field was their life. And he had 10 more days before he had to leave and go back on a next, his next furlough. No, the doc, none of the doctors in China could solve it. None of them in Europe could solve it. None of them from Canada could solve it. No doctors could solve it. So he, he pulled the car off as he was taking Ruth and her companion back to the hotel. He pulled his car off the side of the road, and he explained the situation to them. They said, no problem. We'll pray for you. God will heal you. Because they knew God was a healer. This man had never entertained the possibility of divine healing, of miraculous healing. He never entertained it. But when you're desperate, sometimes you expand your horizon and you start believing in things you never believed in before. So they prayed for him that God would heal him of this disease so that he could stay on the mission field, which is what he wanted to do. Well, they went on. They went home. A year or two later, Ruth was traveling through that close to Chad again. And so she asked somebody, do you know this man? And they said, well, by, by the chance, we do know this man because we met him when he was on his way back to the mission field. So she knew, Ruth knew, that God had healed the man completely of this horrible, unknown problem that he was having and had made him well, and he was able to continue his ministry in China. Well, that's the way Ruth was. One time, she, she got a word from God to, to go, across the, the, go across Russia in a train all by herself. So she loads onto the train it's the middle of winter, and as she's crossing, the Lord instructed her to pray at every stop that the, tr that the train made. So she would set her alarm to wake up at any time of the day or night at the train stops so that she could pray to believe God for the nation of Russia, 
and to believe them that they would release the Jewish people to be able to go back to Jerusalem, to the home of, of, of the Jerusalem, uh, of the Jewish people. So she, she, they came to this stop in the middle of one night. It was freezing cold. There was ice all over the ground. She gets steps off of the plane, the, the train to pray, and she slips on the ice and breaks her ankle. So here she is alone on the train in the middle of Russia. She continues going on the train ride till she gets all the way where she was going and accomplished the feat that God had for her. I want to tell you one more thing about Ruth. Toward the end of her life, she, she, was, she got sick. Nobody knew what was the matter with her, including me, but I knew that she was very ill and she kept getting worse and worse. And finally, I knew that we didn't have much longer on the earth with Ruth. And so I went there, and one of the problems was she couldn't, she couldn't do anything. She was so sick, but she also couldn't see. Well, I'm an eye surgeon, and so I had some equipment that I thought might help her to see. And so I took these trial frames, and I took loose lenses. When I got there, she was at Virginia at this time, and I put the strongest lenses that I had in there to see if I could help her to see something. So I put these on her face. She picks up the Bible, she opens the Bible to just wherever it happened to fall open, and she reads one verse of Scripture. One dieth in his full strength, being holy at ease and quiet. She shuts the Bible, puts it down. The last verse that she read in her life. One dieth in his full strength, being wholly satisfied and at ease. It's a quotation out of, out of the book of Job that she read. And I thought that was a very appropriate scripture for Ruth because she lived in faith and she died in faith and her life is being remembered and will always be remembered, I hope, for all that she did. I don't have time to tell you all the stories of Ruth, Ruth's life. Uh, maybe quickly, she went to Rio de Janeiro because God sent her there and she went up on the hill uh, and where Christ's statue is, and she stretched out her hands, and she, she prayed and believed God for the outpouring of the Holy Spirit in that city and on the nation of Brazil. She didn't know why, but that's why God sent her there was to do that, but she didn't know. When she got back to Jerusalem, she called a friend of hers in Canada, and he said, I know why you did that. He said, because Morris Cirillo is having a huge crusade there the same week that Ruth prophesied all of that, and he was doing this crusade that was going to be sent out to 10 big stadiums in, in the city and in the nation of Brazil, plus like 60 other ones in America and Canada. So Ruth changed the atmosphere in that nation by her prophetic words over the city and over the nation. She traveled her life doing that. That's the kind of woman that she was in God. And I hope some of you pick up that banner and do the same. We hope that you enjoyed these stories of the glory of God. We believe that each story we tell will help build your faith and help to bring a miracle into your life. For more information about this program and Dr. Elizabeth Vaughn, visit her website at godsinstrument.com, her YouTube channel at Glory Stories Now, or write her at Elizabeth Vaughn Ministries Incorporated, P.O. Box 454, Argyle, Texas, 76226, USA.